Good morning, everybody. Ta-da. Good morning, everybody. Hey, is anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Man, I, I think only like, what, 2% was excited, Larry? Yeah, 2%. Is anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm super excited about today. Uh, I, I reached out to Larry. And I was like, hey, I, I came across this song. I heard it. It shook my world. I told Larry, wasn't sure if he was going to attempt it, but he has it in here. I'm super excited about that. Um, but I want to do something a little bit different today as we go into worship. And uh, as you guys know, today is family first. Uh, today is the day that we also recognize uh, Jesus for what he did on the cross. We recognize it through communion. And I want us today, as we come in the house of the Lord to worship him, and as I get ready to give this passage, I want us to think about how we're ushering in the Holy Spirit for ourselves today. Not just for ourselves, but as a body of believers. I want us to, to process that. I want us to think about it. But as we're thinking about it, and as we're going through the first two songs, I want us to be preparing ourselves for communion. Because we're not going to do communion at the end of the service. I want to do communion because communion is a form of worship. I want to do it during our worship set. So as we wrap up the second song, and as before we go into the third song, we're going to do communion So in the time between now and when we do communion, I want us to think about the scripture I'm going to read here in a second. And I want us to prepare our hearts and our minds to be in the right place to receive the body of Christ. You know, and and Jesus, he gave himself completely for us. And the least that we could do is worship him beyond just a song, but in action too, with a remembrance of what he did for us. In 1 Peter 3.18, Peter writes this, he says, For Christ also suffered for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. When we go to look at what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians in chapter 10, in verse 15 through 17, he says, I am speaking as to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I am saying. The cup of blessing that we bless is Is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ, the bread that we break? Is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, since all of us share the one bread. And then in 1 Corinthians, Paul also says in chapter 11, verse 26 to 29, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Look, as we go into these first two songs, I want you to understand that Christ Chapel, we, you don't have to be a member here to partake in communion when we do this in a, in a few minutes. But you do have to be a member of his body. Is giving your life to him. And take the next two songs to, to usher him in, to cry out to him, to, to make sure that you're straight with him so that when we get to that, you're at the next level of worshiping him and thanking him for what he has done. Father God, I thank you and I praise you, Lord. I pray, God, that you're over this service, Lord. Guide us as you only could guide us, Lord God. We usher you in. We open the doors for you today, Father God. In your glorious, glorious name. Amen. Step for all we believe. So 
I for one am gonna give my praise to you Well today's the day it's all or nothing Well all the way my praise goes out to you Oh my praise goes out to you Today's the day I live for one thing To give you praise and everything I do Oh, my praise goes out to you I found love beyond all reason You gave your life, your all for me And call me yours forever Caught in the mercy fallout I found hope, found life, found all I need You're all I need the Time has come to stay for all we believe in So I for one am gonna give my praise to you the time has come to stand for all we believe in. So I for one am gonna give my praise to you, yeah. But today's the day, it's all or nothing. Well, all the way, my praise goes out to you. Oh, my praise goes out to you. Today's the day I live for one thing To give you praise and everything I do Oh, my praise goes out to you All we are is yours And all we're living for is all you are Is all you are It's all you are, all we are, all we are is yours, and all we're living for is all you are, it's all you are, one more time, and all we are is yours, and all we're living for is all you are, it's all the time has come to stand for all we believe in. So I for one am gonna give my praise to you. The time has come to stand for all we believe in. So I for one am gonna give my praise to you. Yeah, today's the day it's all over. Praise goes out to you. Oh, my praise goes out to you. But today is the day I live for one thing to give you praise and everything I do. Oh, my praise goes out to you. If 
find me in the valley Standing with my hands held high The valley will never take my song Find me in the desert Holding on to you for life The desert will never take my song The desert will never take my song and I will praise you I will praise you And I won't let the stones cry I won't let the stones cry out Well, I will praise you Something in me has to And I won't let the stones cry I won't let the stones cry out Find me with the promise Dancing with your prophets I'm still shouting Of everything you've done High upon the mountain I was made to testify Forever You will have my song Forever you will have my song And I will praise you And I will praise you And I won't let the stones cry I won't let the stones cry out Well, I will praise you Something in me has to Well, I won't let the stones cry I won't let the stones cry out The longer I wait, the longer I praise, the stronger the pain, the stronger my faith, the higher the need, the higher I reach, the greater the cost, the more I believe, the longer I wait. The longer I praise, the stronger the pain, the stronger my faith, the higher I need, the higher I reach, the greater the cost, the more I believe, and I will praise you, oh, I will praise you. And I won't let the stones cry I won't let the stones cry out And I will praise you Something in me has to And I won't let the stones cry I won't let the stones cry I will praise you I will praise you And I won't let the stones cry I won't let the stones cry out Well, I will praise you Something in me has to Well, I won't let the stones cry I won't let the stones cry out Well, I will praise you well, I will praise you, and I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry out. Well, I will praise you, cause something in me has to. And I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry. Well, I will
will praise you. Oh, I will praise you. And I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry out. Well, I will praise you. Cause something in me has to. And I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry out. Well, I won't let the stones cry out. The longer I wait, the longer I praise, the stronger the pain, the stronger my faith, the higher the need, the higher I reach, the greater the cost, the more that I need, the longer the wait. The longer I praise, the stronger the pain, the stronger my faith, the higher the need, the higher I reach, the greater the cost, the more I believe. Well, I will praise you, and I will praise you. And I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry out. Well, I will praise you, cause something in me has to. And I won't let the stones cry out. Oh, I will praise you. I will praise you. And I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry out. Well, I will praise you, cause something in me has to. And I won't let the stones cry. I won't let the stones cry A thousand generations falling down in worship, singing a song of ages to the Lamb. And all who have gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing a song of ages to the Lamb. Because your name is highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all and all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy in Christ Holy You lifted high Holy Holy forever And if you've been forgiven And if you've been redeemed Sing a song forever to the Lamb. And if you walk in freedom, and if you bear His name, sing a song forever to the Lamb. We will sing a song forever and amen. And the cry holy all creation cries holy 
Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. And all thrones and dominions, all powers and position. Your name stands above them all. And your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest your name stands above them all and all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. And the angels cry. Let's sing that out. And the angels cry. Holy, all creation cries. Holy, you are lifted high. High, holy, holy forever. I hear your people sing, holy to the King of Kings.
All right, if we can start finding our seats, we'll get moving forward here. As you can see, I am not Pastor Rick. Um, Pastor Rick and, and Paula, they're still on vacation. They're down still visiting her mom. Um, but So in your prayers, just keep them in your prayers. Uh, they'll travel back. I think they start traveling back tomorrow. Um, so just safe traveling mercies for them as we go into that. Um, but I want to take a moment here and, you know, we've been worshiping God and there's many different forms to worship God. And as the ushers come forward, uh, you know, another form of, of worship that we do is tithes and offering. Um, and actually, if you were in Sunday school today, you got to hear Kevin speak about Pentecostal Sunday that was last week. And he was referencing how it was a, a, a giving to Christ, uh, giving to God, I'm sorry, uh, the first fruits of the harvest. And as I was doing some research and I was doing looking at some stuff, um, I came across this in Genesis, and I want to use this today. And it's in Genesis 14, 17 through 20. It says, after Abraham returned from defeating, and I'm going to butcher a bunch of names here. So Pastor Lil Harib, I see you over there. I'm not going to look your way because I know you're going to get me on every name I butcher today. Um, but it said, after Abraham returned from defeating Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the Shiva Valley, that is the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Solomon, brought out bread and wine. And when I was putting this together, I was thinking well, this is communion Sunday too. So I thought that was pretty interesting. The king brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God most high. He blessed him and said, Abraham is blessed by God most high, creator of heaven and earth and blessed by God's most high, who has handed over your enemies to you. And the very next statement, and Abraham give him, gave him a tenth of everything. I know that we offer our tithes and offering as a sign of faith and reverence to God the Most High. I know that scripture is clear that it is one area that we're able to test God. Let us give our tithes and offering today, not to just out of seeking the reward though, but more importantly, because we know we want to show our love and gratitude to God the Most High. We want to show our love and gratitude to his son, Jesus Christ. And we want to show our love and gratitude to the Holy Spirit, who is our counselor. So as we get ready to do this, I just want to put a prayer over it. And just know that your tithes and offering is an act of faith and an act of worship, showing God that you love him and you're thankful for what you have today. Father God, we thank you and we praise you. And I ask just a blessing over each and every person, Lord God. As they're able to give, as they're able to look at it, Lord God, I pray that you stretch their finances. You stretch everything they have, Lord God. You stretch their time as, as they give of their time too. Father, you are the only one that could do this. There's no mathematical sense to it. But Father God, I just pray that you put this blessing over each and every person. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' glorious name. You know, missions are definitely a big thing. Uh, the individual that you saw that was the lead person on that, uh, I'm not going to go into much depth, but he definitely is a miracle walking. Um, I got to hear his testimony back in January of how his recovery through COVID. I mean, he shouldn't be walking today. Um, it is absolutely 100% a miracle. And that man has dedicated his life to missions. Um, you guys have your bulletins. I'm not going to go inch by inch through it. There's a lot of good information here, what we have going on. The couple of quick things I do want to indicate, though, is if we have our family gathering coming up on June 14th, there's a sign-up out there. That helps Becky know what her team's got going on, what's coming in, and then that way we know what we have to supplement with stuff. So please do that. And it's not just a family gathering with a meal. It's a cookie bake-off. Um, and I'm sure there's plenty of bakers out there that want to accept the challenge to put a cookie up in front of a judge. Um, additionally, we have a baseball game sign up out there, if you could look at that. And then the other one that I really want to highlight here is uh, our youth go to camp tomorrow. Uh, so <laughs> I, they're not excited at all. I, I'm not at all. Wait till next Sunday. They'll be sleeping in their seats up here. I promise you. Um, but please keep them in your prayer all week long. Not just them, but keep, the, keep camp in your prayers for the next, what, three, five weeks, because um, camp season is now upon us. Okay, I got one other thing of business, 
and then we're going to get into the message. So if I could please get Amy Guzman and her mom and dad to come on up. If I could get, I got to look at the order here, Eli Mojica and his parents. You guys could just come right up on front here. Um, and then we got Brigham Nelson and his dad. His mom is back in the, the C2 Kids area. So I got that. All right. You guys are wondering what is going on here. Well, we're missing three right now, but these are our past fifth graders. They are no longer fifth graders. They are sixth graders and they have graduated. They're graduating out of the C2 kids area. And something new that we wanted to do is we wanted to recognize them and we wanted to make sure that they had a new sword in their hands. They had a sword that was equipped and ready for them at the age that they're at. And you guys, not knowing it, you guys are the ones got them these swords. And these swords are sitting behind them. But before we hand them this sword, I think it's important for us, I don't know if you guys think so, I believe so, that we maybe stand up, we reach our hands out and we pray over these sixth graders because if you remember that transition from getting to sit in the single classroom all day long to, oh my gosh, I gotta walk every hallway to find every classroom I gotta go to and I've only got five minutes or four minutes, whatever it is today, I don't know. But there's probably a lot of like doubt and fear and unsureness in their hearts but can we pray that they are the light and the beacon of hope that's getting ready to go into our middle school right now? So can we stand, can we raise our hands, can we lift our hands out for them and can we pray for them right now? And keep in mind, there's three that are not here right now, so let's be praying for all of them. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for the hearts that are in front of us, Father God. Father God, I pray for these, these three individuals plus the three that are not here, Lord God. I pray, God, that they are a beacon of hope, that their light shines so brightly in the hallways as they walk around. That, Father God, as they're walking through that sixth graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders, and the teachers that are not believers, they go, what is different about you? And, Father God, allow them to be able to speak from the sword that they have in their hands. Father God, allow them to be able to absorb what is given and allow it to go into their mind and allow it to be a transformation that goes to the heart, Father God. And, Father God, allow them to be able to step in your truth and in your ways as only you can call them to do. And then, Father God, I pray for a blessing and a call of patience over the parents because, Father God, it is not the easy years. And, Father God, I pray that you just continue to walk with these parents and you show them how you want them to feed into their children. And, Father God, allow us as a community of believers, allow us to be with them as they walk through it. Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. So right behind you guys. That's yours. There you go, brother. Oh, wow. Oops, I think I'm good. Okay, there we go. Now what you guys actually came for, the message, right? Okay, so the anticipation for something, the, the excitement that we have when there were, that's being built up as the time gets closer, if it's something that we've just found out about or it's something that maybe occurs all the time, that anticipation, that excitement may not be as great, right? Coming to church every Sunday, the anticipation, the excitement of it probably wears down over a little bit, right? But when it's something that happens rarely, or it is something that is so grand, you want everyone to know that it's going to occur. You want everybody to know. I was thinking about it in Sunday school today, Kevin was talking about his garden that he has just planted and he's already in anticipation of excitement for when it actually starts producing the fruit that he gets to enjoy. I get to enjoy a little bit of it occasionally too. So I'm excited about it too. But you know, even before social media, you know, for those that are really super young, you probably can't imagine that. But before social media, anticipation and excitement would still get the word out. You knew when someone in your family was gonna graduate from high school or college. You knew it. The anticipation and the excitement got it to you. You knew if someone was gonna get married. Congratulations over there. The anticipation, the excitement, it didn't need to hit social media. You knew it was going to happen because the word got out to everybody. You knew when someone was in the playoffs, especially if it was your team. 
You knew who was running for office. If you liked them or not, it didn't matter. You knew who was running for office. And there's many other things I could go on the list with, but anticipation and excitement would get the word out. And this knowledge comes from a will of getting the information out because of the excitement of the individual. Their anticipation of the event creates the excitement within it. Now, unfortunately, there are times that the excitement that one has for an event is not the same that another may have. This could be for many reasons, past experiences, past hurts, past failures that we haven't let go of, being disappointed. It could be overwhelming experiences taking place in our own life that we can't see what other people are going through. It could be jealousy. Man, I wish that was happening to me, so I really don't care that it's happening to them. I think the worst one is that we just don't care about what's happening in other people's lives. So we blow off their anticipation and the excitement that they may have for the event. Another thing with anticipation of the coming hour of an event is there could be mixed emotions or expectations for all those that are present. I want you to imagine it's probably not that far off with the room that I'm standing in. Last year's Super Bowl, we were watching in excitement, right? I'll admit I was cheering for the Chiefs only because my team wasn't in it. But there was an anticipation and excitement that you guys had, right? How about Travis and Jason Kelsey's parents? First time two brothers faced off in a Super Bowl. Those two parents were probably elated when both sons won their championship in their division, in their conference. But then it probably immediately sunk in that, who do I cheer for? The anticipation, the excitement that was in the event, but also at the same time they knew as as the last hour finished on the field, one son was going to be excited and another son was going to be distraught broke down, sad, questioning, did I miss a play? So I can't even imagine the anticipation and the excitement for that hour that came for the Kelsey family. What about as we look back into our history? You know, for centuries, the Israelites have been waiting for the king to come and lead them to victory against all of their oppressors. There was this belief that they, they took from scripture. They believed that there was going to be this king that came. He was, nobody could stand up against him. He was going to be victorious. He was going to be able to stand up against every battle. There was no oppressor that could take him down. And century after century after century, the king was not there as they looked. But yet prophet after prophet, after prophet came in their hour, that prophet's final hour, that prophet's hour of delivering the truth was calling out to them and telling them to turn back to God and repent. And century and century went on. And then they go into what we call, commonly call this silent years, roughly 400 years that we really don't see much. It's kind of quiet in the Bible. And then John the Baptist comes on the scene. And as John the Baptist is doing the work that he's been called to do in the hour that he's been given, John the Baptist starts speaking about, there is one that is greater than me that will come after me. So John the Baptist immediately is saying, hey, look, I'm not the person you're looking for Per se, I'm the person who's coming before the person you're looking for. And John the Baptist presses in his hour that he has to deliver this truth. You know, the problem was that when Jesus came, and it's not Jesus's problem, it's our problem. The problem is, is that when Jesus came, he didn't fit the mold. 
the perception that the people were looking for, the reality that they wanted to stamp on it was not the mold that Jesus fit. So when the king of kings came in his hour, the people weren't sure if he really was the king. You know, three years into his ministry, so this is the back end of his life. After many times of saying his time had not yet come, he enters into Jerusalem on a colt, for his hour had now come. The anticipation of many were, were to cheer and welcome him as a king. If you look at the historical part of it, and, and Pastor Lowell Harib, he did an awesome job back around Easter time talking about it and breaking the four gospels and how the entering in was a representation of a king entering into the city. And there's others that watched for the opportunity to what? To capture Jesus. And then you have this other group, the apostles, that are watching with this alertness because they've been walking with Jesus for three years and they're watching with alertness on where they possibly need to step in, though they never had to step in for Jesus. They just assumed they did. And I could almost imagine if I had been with Jesus for three years, watching all these miracles and we're at this hour where Jesus is entering in on a cult, coming into the week of Passover, I could almost imagine the the apostles, I guess I would say, being proud of themselves because they get to be next to Jesus. And they might even be buying in on the cheer that he is the king that has finally come to conquer all oppressors. And they had the inside track. They had the inside knowledge. They had knowledge of Jesus that we don't even get in scripture because so much couldn't even be written. And then there's Jesus. His anticipation for the hour must have been torn. He knew that this would bring both for himself and for the people. He knew what it would bring. It could only have been from love and obedience for the truth that he could have actually stepped through all of it, through all of the affliction, through all of the pain, a love for the truth and obedience. You know, I want us to look at the book of John here and what takes place after Jesus has entered Jerusalem. There's an encounter that occurs where Jesus speaks to the people of this hour that has now come and some things to be alert to. In one moment, you have at least four different types of anticipation and excitement for this event that is starting to unravel in front of everybody's eyes. And so in chapter, in John chapter 12, and really it's verse 20 through 43, I cut out a little bit of it, but you can go back and read it. It fits in there, but for time's sake, I, I took out a few of the verses, not to remove it completely, just it's for time's sake. So John captures this starting in verse 20. He says, now some Greeks were among those who went up to worship at the festival. So they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and requested of him, sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus replied to them, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Truly, now I, I'm a huge fan of the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. That's the translation I use 99.9% of the time. Don't get me wrong, I still open up my ESV and I open up all the other ones. I'm saying this because in almost every other translation, especially when it comes to Jesus, where it says truly here in the CSB, almost every other translation will say truly, truly, or very truly. And the point of it is, is that the writer the this, this scribe, when it was originally written, they would, in this particular case, they would write truly, truly, for you get the level of pronunciation, the authority or the excitement or the emotions that were behind it. In this particular case, it's Jesus. 
So Jesus' response again is he's talking about the hour of the Son of Man has come. He says, truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. The one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in the world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. Now, my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But that is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven, a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said, and an angel has spoken to him. I want you to capture that. This is the second time that we see that a voice comes from heaven over Jesus. And he says it, that when Jesus says, Father, glorify your name, it says, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. But the people around it, were their hearts in the right place? I don't know. I'm not questioning that. What I'm saying is that all they heard was a thunderous sound or something just speaking to Jesus. I do believe there were some that understood it too. Because what Jesus says next, he responds, he says, this voice came not for me, but for you. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. As for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate what kind of death he was about to die. Then the crowd replied to him, we have heard from the law that Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? Remember I said, he just came in on a cult. They're worshiping him like he's a king. They believe their king of kings has come and he's talking about the son of man but they're not catching it. And Jesus answered, the light will be with you only a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness doesn't overtake you. The one who walks in darkness doesn't know where he is going. And while you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of the light. Jesus said this, then went away and hid from them all. Even though he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. And jumping to verse 42, it says, nevertheless, many did believe in him, even among the rulers, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him so that they would not be banned from the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than the praise from God. With a little bit of time that we have left today, I wanna break this down. I'm not gonna break down every verse but I want us to capture some things that are taking place here. That I believe that Jesus was speaking to the people of that day about this last hour that was coming. And I want us to understand what that means to us today in our last hour of truth. I'm not gonna reread the first three verses, 23 through 26. It's gonna be up there for you, but Jesus is telling them about this hour that has come. This hour in which he will be glorified This hour was taking the final step in giving his life for us. Jesus kept alluding to that. He kept telling his, the apostles about this. He kept telling the disciples about this. The time is coming. My hour is coming. This was a full demonstration that would take place for us to have a pathway to true eternity in heaven. There is no other pathway, folks. It was a demonstration in action in truth that lived out with the words that we must die to live. We must be willing to lose ourselves that is of this world so that we can become one that produces fruit for the kingdom of God. Look, you could believe me or not, it doesn't matter to me. I am gonna be truthful to what God has placed on my heart. You could be producing fruit right now that is not for the kingdom of God. You could look in the book of Romans. It talks about it. It says, you're either producing fruit that's with the kingdom of God or you're producing fruit that is bad fruit. And if you wanna know what bad fruit is, it's fruit that's produced in the darkness that is for Satan. Look, that's the only two different types of fruit you could be producing right now. 
And what Jesus demonstrated through action is a step and a path of how we are able to produce fruit that represents the kingdom of God. Look, for us, the hour has come to fully live out the truth in word and action. It is a time for our hearts and our minds, along with our actions, our visible exterior to match in truth. This might hurt not one thing on Sunday morning and the rest of the week doing something completely different. You cannot produce good fruit and bad fruit at the same time. You cannot stand on the fence and think that just you're getting enough warmth from the sun over here, the S-O-N, and thinking you could survive in the darkness because of that. You have to fully commit yourself to Jesus Christ. You have to fully commit yourself to the truth. If you are not, you're walking a very dangerous path. When we commit ourselves to living that way, we align ourselves with Jesus Christ. In doing so, we must be vulnerable and truthful to show that we are not perfect. Look, there has only ever been one person that's walked this earth who has been perfect. And that is Jesus Christ. So if you ever walk around thinking you're perfect, you're caught in a lie. But being vulnerable and truthful about your imperfections is allowing your weaknesses to be a strength for Jesus. We are made strong in him when we fully hand it over. We become this beacon of hope for the lost and struggling individuals that we allow for the truth to be seen in us. We are not called to live a lie, but rather we are called to live a life of truth for him. I wanna say that again. We are not called to live a lie, but rather we are called to live a life of truth for him. You can see that Jesus was even living in a place of vulnerability and and truthfulness in this passage. In 27 and 28, I wanna go back to it and said. Now my soul is troubled. This is a moment of vulnerability and truth by Jesus Christ. He's telling all those that are willing to hear him that his soul is troubled. He goes on, he goes, what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? But immediately his response to his own question is, but that is why I came to this hour, glorify your name. Jesus was sharing with the disciples and those that were listening that he was troubled with the final hour as it approached. Jesus knew that he needed to suffer through this hour for something greater to be. For him, it was fulfilling prophecy and giving us the path to gaining ourselves in him. He gave us the example to follow on how to face the hour while being a beacon of hope and light. The suffering and affliction we face in our hour creates the beacon of hope and living and a living demonstration of action and truth for others to see today. Look, in Romans, Paul captures it. He says, affliction produces endurance and he goes all the way through and it produces this hope. Look, I'm gonna be truthful to you. Life is not gonna be easy. Life is gonna throw a lot of things at you. And the more you press in to be closer to Jesus Christ, the enemy is gonna attack more. The enemy wants you to think your life is supposed to be comfortable. The enemy wants you to think that you're not supposed to have any problems. The enemy wants you to think you're supposed to be selfish and that you just get whatever you want. Can I tell you, that is not what it is. If it was, then Jesus Christ would not have died on the cross for our sins today or our sins that we produce today. He would not have had to suffer because selfishly he could have just avoided it. So why do we think that we're better and we don't have to suffer for him? Or 
Earlier I said that Jesus' anticipation for the event must have been torn. I cannot imagine how the anticipation built in him as he goes through the week to the Last Supper. He knows that he's been betrayed and he still comes to the Last Supper. And I want you to think of this. He knows who's betrayed him. He knows that this is the Last Supper. We celebrated and worshiped that earlier. But Jesus demonstrates another act of truth and obedience in love. He washes every one of their feet. He demonstrates once more, it is not about self, but it is about the love that you have for others. And then after the supper, man, the anticipation must have been overwhelming. When you look at scripture, you could, you could even see that when he's in the garden praying, the angels are over him and angels over him and his prayer is so strong, the sweat is like blood coming off of him. The anticipation, but not excitement of the coming event. Though I imagine for Jesus, there probably was a level of excitement in it too, because he knew what it meant. But the anticipation of the event was overwhelming, but Jesus walked through it. You know, and after his arrest and the initial facade, let's just call it a fake trial, literally a fake trial, he is taken to Pilate. John is uh, only one of the, the four writers of the gospels who captures more of a conversation that takes place between Jesus and Pilate. Now you could go read this on your own. It's in chapter 18 of John. I just wanna pull out one little piece of it. And I, and I find the conversation between Jesus and Pilate very interesting. But in verse 37 and 38, this conversation takes place and, and there's this, been this back and forth and you could see this part that you say you are a king, that, that's in every one of the, the books of the gospels. But Pilate asks him, you are a king then. You say that I'm a king. I was born for this. And I have come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And I imagine there must have been this presence with Jesus, no matter what the conversation was. It must have just drawn people in, unless their heart was so hard, they couldn't even hear it. But I imagine in this conversation, it takes place and Jesus says this, and think about this, when he says, I was born for this. I was born as son of man for this. I was born for this hour. I came into the world for this hour. I came to the world for this hour so that everybody knows what the truth is. And I imagine there was a tone and a presence and you could probably hear a pin drop in the room when he was done. And then Pilate says, what is truth? Kind of just blows it off. Pilate didn't even want to hear what the truth was. It is this, what is truth that Pilate said that jumped out to me? Because right after this, we don't know of any other conversation that really takes place between the two of them. What we do know that takes place is Pilate goes out and unsuccessfully tries to release Jesus. And we really don't know if Pilate allowed for the question to be answered, the what is truth? I really, I read it and I think it's probably stated more in a cynical way. Pilate could have probably gave a care less what Jesus could have said after that. You know, when someone's in that level of political stature or in a position of power, 
is truth really truth? And what I mean that to that is truth to Pilate, like others in these positions of power, is what they make it so that they can be comfortable with the decisions that they need to make. Now, I'm not saying that's for everybody all the time, right? If you're living for Christ, you really truly are trying to make decisions that are aligned with the truth. But if Pilate believed the truth in that moment, Jesus would not have gone to the cross. Now, at least not in that moment, he wouldn't have. You know, truth is not something that many really seek after. If Pilate was truly hearing the truth, I come back to it, would he have convicted Jesus? Like many, Pilate saw truth in what is physical and what is rewarding for the individual glory. The issue with this is that it is of this world and Jesus represents beyond the physical world. He represents the spiritual. He represents the battles that are taking place that you and I cannot see. Jesus represents the king of kings, the warrior of warriors, the Lord of lords, who is defending us from stuff we cannot see that is taking place around us. And he said, I came for this hour so that the truth is known for this hour for everybody to have an opportunity to gain their life in eternity in heaven with me. And Pilate didn't want to hear it. The Pharisees did not want to hear it. Those that were cheering on for the murderer to be released did not want to hear it. You cannot hear or see what Jesus is talking about unless you fully hand it over to him. If you don't fully hand it over, you're caught in the midst of a truth, mixed truth and mixed lies, and you don't know what is truth and what is lies. But by handing your life over to him, he opens your eyes, he opens your heart, he opens your mind to see it. And the transformation, there is a transformation that's immediate, but there is a lifelong walk that you have to go through to fully transform your heart to be that much more of him and less of yourself. You know, I already stated it before, in our hour, we are called to speak of the truth. But like Pilate, do we care to speak or to know the truth? I'm being honest. Do we really truly care to speak and know the truth or do we want our luxury lives that we have? Because let me tell you folks, we are not persecuted. I read an article the other day, a family in China that has a two-year-old boy were arrested because mom and dad both had a, they had a Bible, a family Bible. That two-year-old will never see the light of day again. That two-year-old was convicted with their parents to spend a life in prison. just because they had this. So I throw that out to you again. Do we really care to know the truth? Are you really willing to give more of yourself away so that you could become more of him to deliver the truth? You know, many will say to include myself, It's a saying that I've said for over the years and I picked it up from my dad who in in a portion of his career, he was an arson investigator. And he he had told me this. He said that um, one's perceptions is one's reality. Now my dad, he broke it down for me to understand what the concept was. And I use it in the same manner that my dad did as if, if I'm talking to someone, I might ask him what their perception of it is or what they see as their reality because it allows me to see where they're at in the moment. But I don't take that as truth. I'm not discrediting what they are saying to me. That's, I don't want you to under, I I don't want you to be misconstrued here. I'm listening to where they are at in their life. But I don't label it as truth. I may use it as a starting point for a conversation. See, here's the problem though. Many who use it that say, that somebody's perception is their reality is what they're really saying is somebody's perception is their truth. And not just their truth, but the truth. 
And the danger in this is that when we say that somebody's perceptions is the truth, we are giving them the leeway to state what is truth and what is not truth for what they're feeling that day. We have to be cautious for what we say is true and what is not true. There is realities, there are perceptions, and then there is truth. And we have to be cautious what label we're putting on something. You know, in the ESV Fire Bible, in the study notes, it said this, an essential part of Jesus's mission on earth was to glorify, was to testify to the truth and point people to it. That truth includes the fact that he is God in human form and that he came to bring spiritual salvation by restoring people's opportunities for a relationship with God. The truth of this gospel, i.e. the good news of forgiveness and a new life through Jesus Christ is now recorded in this scripture. God's written word, which is God's truth to humankind. This is truth. These 66 books are truth. If you're not reading it, then how do you know what is true? If you're not allowing it to go into your mind and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you about it, if you're not allowing it to go the 18 inches to your heart, to continuously circumcise your heart, then how do you know if it's truth that you're hearing? Do not get caught up in someone else's perception of reality. Allow truth to be your truth. We know and can see that Jesus always spoke the truth, but as you can see in our main passage today, it was his last hour that had come for him in his human form. There was a final press of Jesus to say that what he needed to say in this last hour We see in this following portion, this press by Jesus to get the people to open their hearts to his message. He says, starting in verse 30, he says, this voice came not for me, but for you. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out for me. If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw people to myself. The light will only be with you a little longer. Walk while you have the light so the darkness doesn't overtake you. The one who walks in darkness doesn't know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of the light. If you wanna know how you become light and children of the light, you give your life to Jesus Christ. Then you are able to walk where he calls you. Look, earth is not our domain. This is not our final resting place. Jesus Christ came and died for us so that we have an opportunity in heaven. But he is asking for us in our hour, in our last hour to press and to share the truth and to be a beacon of hope, be a beacon of light as he was when he walked this earth. The question is, are you willing to pick that up? You know, just four chapters later in in 16, one through four, Jesus says this, I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. They will ban you from the synagogues. If you're not sure what that is, they will ban you from the churches. May not be happening completely here, but I just told you of another country that that is happening in. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering service to God. They will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me, but I have told you these things so that when their time comes, you will remember I told them to you. I wanna jump to another book that John wrote that brings a little bit more light to what Jesus is saying here. Now, and he's talking about this last hour, our last hour. I challenge you to go read this on your own. So 1 John 2, 15 through 25, I'm not reading all of that. I'm, I just have a small portion here, but John, uh, 1 John 2, 15 through 25, go read that on your own. But starting in verse 18, he says, "'Children, it is the last hour.'" And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. By this, we know that it is the last hour. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and all of you know the truth. What is the truth? It's this right here. You know the truth. You have no excuse. If you choose to accept it or not, it doesn't matter in the sense of in Jesus's eyes. 
That is how he's going to look at you. Did you accept it or not? You have heard it because you're sitting here today. What you have heard from the beginning is to remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the son and in the father. And this is a promise that he himself made to us. Eternal life. There is nothing greater, my friends. You know, Paul gives a similar warning to Timothy and really to us about this last hour. In 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, he says this, for the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear, their realities, their perceptions, not the truth. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to miss. Folks, we live in a world that is full of a lot of myths that are disguised as truths. There is one book that you could go to that will give you all the truth that you need. The question is, are you willing to pick it up? You know, I wanna go back to this part where we, Jesus is talking to the people. You know, there was many that saw the miracles of Jesus firsthand, directly from what he did. And even many that saw the miracles through Peter and Paul, but they did not believe. There were many that were witnesses to the words that Jesus spoke, that were present to hear his tone, his passion, his love for the truth and his father, our father. And still many did not believe. I think what's even sadder, scripture even tells us that there was many that believed, yet they remained silent in word and action. Because they were afraid to lose what the earth offered them. They were afraid to lose their position. They're afraid to lose the physical properties that they had. Maybe they're afraid to lose their health. I know scripture says that they were afraid that the Pharisees would not let them into the synagogues. Man. I pray that I personally have the fortitude and the endurance through the afflictions that I face, no matter if the doors at Christ Chapel are closed, the doors at every single church in the United States are closed, that I still have the personal fortitude and endurance to stand at the corners to say that he is truth. I pray that I have the personal fortitude and endurance to say, I don't care what you do to me, I'm gonna tell you about the truth. You can listen to everybody else, I don't care. If that's their perception and their reality, I'm praying that they make a transition in their life that is a transformation, that is a lifetime transformation for eternity. Those that believed, some of those that believed were just afraid that they couldn't go into the synagogue What myth, what lie are you holding on to that's holding you back from saying this is truth to others? Look, we're in our last hour. Look, population wise, we can live another thousand, another 2000. I don't know. Scripture is very clear that none of us know the second that the trumpet is gonna blow. So that is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is our time individually is only for a short second. 
And we get only of what? An hour to proclaim his name, to live by his truth. We are in the last hour of truth for us that are sitting here today. We were made for this hour. We were brought here for this hour. We were not brought for an hour that was a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago or for a thousand years from now. We are brought to this hour right now as the last hour of truth that we get to hold on to scripture and we get to tell people about who Jesus Christ is. What is holding you back? Do you know that the average church in the United States barely holds 60 people on a Sunday morning? 60 to 70 people is the average attendance right now. Folks, there's too many that are holding on to myths that the enemy has disguised as truths. This is truth. You know, I want to come back to the ESV study note said an essential part of Jesus's mission on earth was to testify to the truth and point people to it. Folks, this is our mission. That's the great commission. We are called to say what the truth is. Do not be afraid if they close the doors of the churches. Still stand on his word. Because I could tell you that day of persecution is coming. Do not believe that we will never fall into that trap because it's coming. Allow the truth to make you strong now through afflictions now so your endurance and hope is there when the time comes. We must recognize that this is our final hour and we must press in and deliver the truth. Let us have comfort in the fact that even Jesus was troubled in his soul as we are too. Look, There's going to be times of fear, but hand it over to him. There's going to be times of doubt, but hand it over to him. There's going to be times you're not sure, but hand it over to him. There's going to be times someone's going to ask you a question and you don't know the answer. You know what you say? I don't know it right now, but can I get back with you tomorrow? Look, press in. Do not fall to the mist. Share who Jesus Christ is. Let our remaining time that we have with our last hour of truth Be something that glorifies his name. No other name but his. I want to close this with this. If you only had one hour after you left here today, just one hour, what would you do with it? Maybe you're sitting here right now going, I never given my life to Christ. Would you change the trajectory of your eternity? Because folks, there's two different eternities. One is in hell and one is in heaven. And it's not just as simple as I make a decision and I go live my old life the rest of my life. That's not what I'm saying. It is a transformation that you're willing to grow in him. If you had one hour left, would you give it to him? Or would you say, I'm okay to do it on my own? Maybe with the one hour you have left, you go, man, I'm living for Jesus Christ right now, but man, I'm probably not in the right place. And I just want to cry out in repentance to him. That he gives me the strength to push with biblical truth for the last hour that I have on this earth. This next statement hits home to me. I believe it's true to each of you. You have one hour left when you leave here. Which loved ones are you going to call to give them an opportunity to change their eternity? I have loved ones in my life that right now, if it was to happen, we'd be on different sides of eternity. And it breaks my heart. Don't waste your last hour. Let us not slumber this last hour of truth away. Allow the anticipation and the excitement of the future that you have with him be so bold in you that you just want to share it with everybody. Don't hold back. 
This week, share the good news with another just as you would for something big happening in your life. Because what could be bigger than eternity in heaven? With your eyes closed, your heads bowed, as you ponder this last hour of truth that you have, if you're one that say, man, I want that first piece, I need to give my life to Jesus Christ today. I realize I need to, to step forward and to grab his truth. I don't want the myths of the world anymore. If you want his truth today, you wanna give your life to him today, please raise your hand because I wanna pray for you. Okay. Maybe you're sitting here going, I wanna be prepared for that hour as I get ready to walk out the door and I just, I want to individually repent. I wanna cry out to God. I wanna ask God to just give me the strength, the endurance to, to face the weak so that I go out delivering the truth with boldness. If that is you, please raise your hands. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. If we could just all stand. I'm gonna pray a prayer of blessing over you. And then I'm gonna excuse us, but I'm gonna stay up here for anybody who needs individual prayer today. Jane's gonna greet everybody as they're walking out the door. So you guys are still gonna get a handshake. If you got a complaint about my message, please tell Jane and Jane will do whatever she's gonna do with it. But please know that whatever you might be feeling right now, it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit. I can only speak the truth for what God has called me to speak. I cannot make it about self. But right now, it's between you and God. Father God, I thank you and I praise you. We lift it up to you, Father God. God, go with your children this week. Father God, give us the strength to recognize the differences between myths and truth. Allow our last hour of truth to be with boldness, with no worries and taking away the fears of a synagogue or a church door closing. Lord God, we wanna speak boldly about you. We want our loved ones to know who you are that don't know yet. God, leave us with such peace and hope and love so that our light of beacon, our beacon of hope is so bright that people ask us why we're different. Father God, we love you and we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' glorious name. And Father, I just ask for a special blessing over each and every person this week. In Jesus' glorious name, amen.